When you're trying to improve at anything, whether it's business, parenting, or of course, running, the first place most of us go is to the internet. We search and fall down rabbit holes. We follow gurus and influencers. We look up this article and that study. And before you know it, you aren't sure what's truth, what's important, and what is just plain myth. So today, we're gonna bust a few of those myths with strength coach and trail runner, Coach Tara Pruitt. Welcome to The Planted Runner. I'm Coach Claire Bartholik, and my mission is to help you improve your running, your mindset, and your life with science-backed training and plant-based nutrition. In this episode with Coach Tara Pruitt, you'll learn what she thinks are some of the biggest myths in the fitness industry, why a little strength training can be the best thing you do for your running, and how you can get started trail running, even if you're brand new. Tara has over 25 years in the fitness industry, and her passion is helping people discover their true fitness and reach big, scary goals. In her training studio, Tara coaches athletes to cross their first finish line strong and helps them conquer the trails. Tara is an amazing human, and I am thrilled to say that she'll be joining me this September for the Asheville Running Retreat. Tara will explain what her role will be at the incredible experience we have planned. But if you're ready to learn more right now, head to theplantedrunner.com slash retreat to learn all about it and sign up. There are only a few luxury cabins left, so if you've been on the fence about joining us, this is your sign to sign up today. Tara is also giving away a freebie for Planted Runner listeners if you're ready to get into trail running. So check out the show notes and get your free trail guide today. And now here is my conversation with Coach Tara Pruitt. Welcome to the Planted Runner, Tara. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you here. And uh, we're just going to jump right in. And one of the topics that you get fired up about is debunking the lies we're told in the fitness industry. So this is juicy. What are the lies that we're told? Oh my, there are so many. It's uh, it's hard to start with just one, but I would say my top three to five, starting with those, are um, that you have to be sore from a workout every time. And that's absolutely not true. And it does not define whether your workout was good, whether you worked hard enough, whether you are seeing, going to see results, um, the basic, basic line of judging soreness, um, is going to come from a lot of variations. You know, there's so many things that lead up to the day of a workout that could come into play that are going to determine how, uh, sore you could be from fatigue to enough rest to nutrition, uh, to stress levels. Like that's a big one that, it really boggles my mind why we have portrayed this as being something that we should be judging that our workout was good or not good. Yeah. And usually it means we've overdone it, right? Absolutely. Or that we may need to have taken a rest day. A lot of times we are not listening to our bodies and not being given the permission to be like, there's a lot going on right now. Maybe I should pick a different workout or maybe I should take a rest day. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we get to the point sometimes um, when we're, you know, pushing really hard that we kind of have this like, I don't know, masochistic thing that it's like, oh, I know I got a good workout because I'm sore today. You know? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I'm guilty of that. Trust Uh me. I think we all are guilty of that. I think that's definitely something that can be the deterrent of whether we should continue to push or not or that we need to push harder. And training plans and all like, we, we, we love to prescribe training plans. We love to be able to give the impression that this is exactly how it should look. And if you follow this to a T, then you're doing it right. But we also need to know that come the, a certain phase in the training plan, if your body is saying no, 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 and you keep push, 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 it's going to lead to injuries. It's going to mm-hmm. lead to, it's going to lead to overtraining and it's going to lead, lead coming into either race day or that final day, whatever that goal may be, it's going to lead into that maybe even falling completely apart. Right. Uh, so I think that the, uh, judging every workout from a soreness perspective is the wrong approach. Mm-hmm. And we, we as a fitness industry tend to shove that on people. 
you know, a trainer might sound masochistic because they are taking pride in if you to are totally smashed from the workout that they gave you, uh, a coach or a trainer. And, and probably in my early days, I took a lot of pride in that. But now as I've grown into this journey, I have been able to kind of make sure that we're checking in with each client and being able to judge, you know, the first couple of questions I ask a client when they come in is, how is your sleep? How is your nutrition yesterday? And how are you feeling today? Like, let's do a little check-in instead of just jumping right in to a training session. Ooh, I love and that. I think that's a fair question to ask yourself when you are doing online training or coaching that you do a little assessment. You know, how am I feeling today? Like, yes, this needs to get checked off my list, but let's check in to see uh, some of these other things and, and be able to kind of use that as a little bit of a guide. Mm -hmm. I think I think sometimes we don't trust ourselves because there are times when we don't feel like running or we don't feel like doing that extra rep. And there's honestly nothing wrong with us. And we just need a little push. And we're just like, oh, well, I'm just going to do it. Or no, I'm not going to do it because I'm lazy. So I think it's a lot to do. We, we just don't trust what's good for us sometimes, uh -huh. you know? Absolutely. And there is a difference in not doing it because we choose not to or we or deciding to pull back on the workout that day. I, I would say lazy is a great term. Or we just need to work on that mental capacity. The, the, the challenge of, yes, I can. It's my brain telling me I can't. Yes, I can. And I usually use like a two rep reserve with clients. When we're going through a strength training session, I try to say, okay, this is your, I want you to hit this mark at this intensity level but I want you to give me a two rep reserve. And that would give you a chance to for that client to be able to judge whether they are pushing themselves to the ability that they could be, but also making that mind-body connection that we tend to miss out on. Mm -hmm. So always something left in the, t in the tank when we're training. Yeah, but not much. Yeah. Just, just, just a little bit. Yeah, like I could keep going and that's great. Um, and then there are places like sprint training where we want to give it all. We want it to empty the tank or hit training. So we want to empty the tank. That's where I explain to people that it should feel like you have nothing else left and you just have to try to give a hair bit more just to cross the finish line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are some of the other myths that really bug you? <laughs> um, okay. So um, that you have to eat within 30 minutes of a workout in order to um, lose your progress. And in the strength training world, we tend to hear a lot of this from terms of you must eat within 30 minutes or you've lost your whole workout or you've lost all your gains. And that is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. While you are more metabolically efficiently going to digest and absorb and get those nutrients to the places that they will need to be going, it is not true that you're going to lose everything from that workout of the day or from your future gains. That is absolutely not. I'm so tired of hearing uh, people talk about that, that this is the end all right here. And, you know, there I have a lot of clients that I train at 5, 6, and 7 a.m. in the morning. And yes, I would love to have them pre-plan something to take with them on their way to their next step of the day, whether it be work or getting a shower or whatever it may be. But if they can eat within a couple of hours, great. I mm -hmm. would prefer them to get a full, well-planned meal, balanced meal within a couple of hours. If you can get something in within 30 minutes, awesome as well, but it's not the end all. It's not the end of the world. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It can be more important if you're doing doubles, working out multiple times mm -hmm. a day when you're really trying mm -hmm. to do that. But overall, for normal life, your body is pretty smart mm -hmm. and it'll take it when it needs it, right? It it will. It will. And you're right. Dub, um, if I have a client that's doing a training session in the morning and then a, and a cardio session in the afternoon for, you know, different purposes, then yes. I mean, I would prefer they get fuel in as soon as possible, but it isn't going to wreck the whole day. And making sure of planning with that client that they're con they're planning the rest of the day to make sure that they don't forget food, which is what most people do. They get busy and they just don't do anything at all. So making sure that they have a plan in place for the rest of the day by prepacking food or having a plan in place with places they're going to stop at or if they're just going home. Even I even encourage clients that work from home to try to prep their food so that it's just easy to grab out of the fridge and there is no excuses for 
um, getting stuck on the computer for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you find people that you work with tend to undereat or tend to overeat? Because I struggle sometimes e- talking to both of those people because they're very different athletes. Some people have a real problem with overeating. I mean, this is America. Lots and lots and lots of people do. But, you know, a lot of the really serious runners have the opposite problem and under eat. What, what are you finding with the people you work with? I have a mix of both, but I do find that I, we lean more towards the under eat because they get so, conf- they get so locked up or bottled up with the right or the wrong that they just don't eat anything. Uh. And then they get to the evening time and that's where the overeating tends to happen because you're so hungry by that point that you're just eating everything. And especially when it comes to parents with small kids, you know, you're fixing them dinner and you're snacking on all the things while you're fixing dinner. So, yeah, I, I get a mix of both, but I most definitely see, especially in women, under eating because they're not certain if they're they're afraid of eating the wrong things. And then then it just leads to overeating down the road. And it, it can get frustrating when it comes to encouraging them that they need to be fueling their body and our bodies want to eat and and I'd rather they eat something than nothing Mm -hmm. until we can work on that next step Mm -hmm. so I'll try to just make a couple of suggestions along the way so that it doesn't feel overwhelming a lot of people aren't in a place that they want to take on that whole big chapter yet and so small steps along the way are the best way to start that you know what are you doing now and how can we make one or two adjustments now. And when we when we get the hang of that, then we'll make a couple more adjust, adjustments. So that that's the that's most of the population that is would prefer to adjust in small spaces and small t- small um places moving forward versus biting the whole thing off at one time. Yeah, yeah. That's how you get overwhelmed and you're more likely to quit. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're just like, oh, I can't do it, Get, hand me all the Snickers or, or whatever it is, yes. you know. Um, yes. a- a- any other myths you want to debunk here? <laughs> yeah, I think um, my other biggest factor is um, that you, um, that cardio, uh, car- that cardio is better than strength or strength is better than cardio. Mm-hmm. And I 100% disagree with both avenues. They have a place to complement each other. And they have a place to, you can create balance. So I would say 10 years ago, we were in a realm that it was all cardio or even 20 years ago. I mean, everything was cardio, 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 from classes to the machines to, um, and it was great that we we as women were finally finding our place and working our way into the um, running world, This that which is fantastic. But now it's all strength training is the jam. Like this is the only place to be a strength training. And there is a perfect place to find some balance. One doesn't cancel each other out. On top of too much, a a new um, thing that's a new thing that keeps getting repeated is all the cardio in the world is going to diminish all your strength gains. Mm. And and ultimately what it's going to boil down to is are you fueling well enough to support the two if you have them both on board? And it, it's not one cancels the other out or too much of one cancels the other out. But we've got to find a place that you're fueling well to be able to to support both modalities. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's hard to do both of them really, really well, right. though. Yes. I mean, you do have to prioritize one or the other or you probably are going to be just, you know, not improving in both. Is that right? Absolutely. And so that can come in phases mm-hmm. instead of feeling like you can um, win at uh, a strength training contest, which is probably not always going to happen, or, you, or you're or you going to try to train for a specific race goal. So you, you want to make sure that that strength training is still implemented, but it's not the priority at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mistake I see a lot of runners make is they don't strength train at all during any of their training season. And, I'm, and there is a place for it. If you have already introduced it, I wouldn't introduce strength training brand new into a new training, uh, running training phase. If that's it, if you're training for something specific or you're trying to PR something, maybe adding some body weight strength training could be beneficial, but to completely add everything on board all at once brand new would not be ideal and is not going to be conducive to reaching the goal that you're looking for. But if you've been strength training and say, 
during your off season of running, you want to increase that and see some more, see some more gains or play with some more lifts or, or challenge yourself in a different way. That's the time to do it, but still keep it, maybe change the, the, the approach of strength training as you head into more of your training season to um, reach that running goal. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say so many runners <laughs> don't have seasons. They're just like, yes. I'm a marathoner and I'm yes. just going to do marathon after marathon. And that's just my life. And I want to get faster at the 5K and I want to get stronger. And I want to PR in every race that I run every single weekend. And, I, you know, I, I have no, there's nothing wrong with that if it brings you joy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but exactly. if if you're happy and healthy, keep doing what you're doing. You don't need us. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they don't have off season. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you how do you roll something like that in? I still encourage strength training in a different. I pull back on the heavier lifts. We still work on um, single sided movement, um, multidirectional movement, balance, stability, and I don't pull back on the weights, though. We just take out those heavier lifts and we focus on more conditioning work so that they're, they can still see those movements benefit their running. And it plays such a big role, especially in trail running, but also in road running when you are not always, you don't always have the chance to switch the different muscle group changes in road running unless you happen to be doing a track workout or a sprint workout. Whereas in trail running, you have the ability to switch a little bit more um, muscle recruitment with the types of agility movements that you're doing to hop around on the trail. But you also might be hiking one moment or slow jogging a next or hitting a downhill mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a trail is an entirely different a game. And then the strength training is going to come into play with that so okay. that we're, we're recruiting those different muscles in different ways. But I still pull back on the strength training to at least two days a week, but then the, the entire workout might change just so that we're not hitting those heavy lifts as hard. We're keeping that muscle memory in there. We're still going through some of the motions, but we're focusing more on some of the conditioning work. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get into um, more trail running in just a little bit, but I I'm glad you brought up strength training versus conditioning. I don't think everybody knows the difference. Could you explain? Mm -hmm. From a strength training programming standpoint, most of most programs are going to have a focus on a couple of main lifts, say a deadlift, a squat, um, a bench press, a row, or an overhead press. So those are going to be your main five main lifts. Then you work on, so you're going to focus the first part of the warm up is going to be on mobility. You get your body warmed and prepped and ready to lift heavy. You, you pick pick a couple of those exercises depending on the athlete. And then you, the, after those heavy lifts are done, we move on to conditioning work, things that are going to focus on um, less weight but still challenging, a little bit higher reps, and could op offer single-sided movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just getting a little bit of different practice in there. Also engaging more through the core or the upper back so that we can make sure that that posterior chain is activated, but also making the connection between the upper and the lower body being able to communicate well together by using your core. Mm, okay. I love that. I love that. Um, another thing that you brought up a little bit earlier was the idea of balance. And I <laughs> talk about this a lot that I hate that word because I don't think anybody's balanced. And I think if you try to be balanced all the time, you're never going to do anything well. So I think it's important to be unbalanced sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about balance and big goals. How do you do it? Before I get back to the conversation, I want to talk about a massive problem that I see with runners everywhere, and especially plant-based runners. You know that I'm the first to tell you that you can absolutely get everything you need from a plant-based diet as an endurance runner, but most runners are struggling. With our busy lives and time-consuming training schedules, making sure that you get enough to fuel your training and making sure that it's actually optimal for your health and performance is a real challenge. So that's why I tell all my athletes to make nutrition simpler and get Neurofi Plus by Prevenex. In less than a minute, you can mix their superior quality protein shake up with just water in a shaker bottle, and it actually tastes delicious. That is not the case with other plant-based powders I've tried. You can enjoy Neurofi right after a workout knowing you are getting everything you need for muscle repair 
with none of the junk that you're going to get in one of the lower quality powders. Another cool way to use it is to mix up a couple of scoops with water or warm plant-based milk right before bed. Studies have shown that taking 20 to 30 grams of protein right before bed is the optimal time for protein synthesis and muscle repair that we all need. Look, this is the only product that I'm working with, and that's for a very good reason. I believe in Prevenex quality, their mission, and I use Neurofi Plus myself. And I'm not the only one. Lindsay Hine of All Have Another, Jason Fitzgerald of Strength Running, Whitney Hines of The Mother Runners, Elite Athlete, Emily Enfeld, and so many others in the running world are passionate about Prevenex too. If you're ready to simplify your nutrition and optimize your fueling, you can try Neurofi for 15% off the regular price with my code PR15. That's PR15 at Prevenex.com. And now back to our conversation. Okay, I'm glad you brought this up. <laughs> okay. So the most of the people that I get come to me and they have this all or nothing mentality. So they're either all in or all out. I don't believe the balance is directly in the middle. I believe sometimes it swings this way and sometimes it swings this way. And in order to achieve goals, you do have to be unbalanced. You do have to be a little obsessed. You do have to have your eyes on the prize. But And that's where the unbalance comes from. But then when that goal is hit, I do feel that we need to bring it back a little bit more towards the middle versus always the I'm all out or I'm all in. And that's where it's easy to get sucked in from what society tells us, especially if you're following every single fitness influencer or famous runner out there. They're not telling you the ins and the outs of their true to true, true daily day to day life. The fact that they could that they that 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 is it all on all in all the time, and we get this persona as we're watching on the outside that they're all in all the time. They never give up, and there's no other way. And this is the way that it has to be achieved, and I must follow this. And that's not going to pertain to our day to day lives with families and kids and schedules and sports and our own commitment to our own goals. And so that's where I tend to try to get athletes, and especially as parents, to really work on that. Yes, this your family is your priority, but your goals are important too. And sometimes it might mean asking for help, getting your friends to kick in, getting your spouse to pick up just a little bit extra, you know, so that you can squeeze in that extra hour of work. So it doesn't have to look like the athletes. It doesn't have to look like your goals don't exist or your goals aren't that important. But we can find um, a little bit of a happy medium. And w during during that phase that you're working towards a specific goal, a race or whatever that may be, you might need a little bit of selfish time in there to ask for a little bit more, but then you'll pull it back to normal. So I call balance like, yep, a little bit of selfishness up here. We're going to go for it. And it's my turn. And then next time it's dad's turn or next time it's, you know, the siblings turn because it's their eyes, their time for their spotlight. But then we pull back to a little bit of 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 more balance. And I don't even say normalcy because none of us have normalcy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But I mean, everything I 100 percent agree with everything you just said. But, you know, I got to be honest, like. It feels really selfish on Saturday morning when the kids are, uh, you know, watching cartoons and and the spouse is making pancake and you're like, OK, I'm going on my three hour run now. Like there's a lot of guilt, a lot of mom guilt, dad guilt, spouse guilt, whatever you want to say. You know, we don't actually have to be trying this hard. You know, we could be fit without these big goals. And so like the the mom brain, the dad brain start feeling bad about ourselves. So what would you say to that? I say that it's important for our kids to see us chase after the things that make us happy. Yes. I think that, you know, my son is 26. And if he had not watched me get to where I am now, not that I've ever arrived because I never will, but if he had not watched me chase after the things that set my soul on fire, I don't know that he would be as determined to chase after the things that he, that drive him and inspire him and make him feel complete and whole. It, now that he's starting to catch on to what that, what, why he, what, he grew up in the gym setting, he lifts now and he makes exercise a daily part of his life. And 
I think that it's it's important that our kids see us do things we still love and enjoy, or we bring them with us. You know, he didn't want to be a runner, and that's okay. But he did start strength training and and, him, and lifting. So I got, I won in that aspect. And <laughs> if, you know, your kids might a sprinter or a triathlete or um, you know a track star, whatever that may be. But them watching you accomplish hard things inspires them to chase after hard things as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I think our kids need to, to see us being good, good adults. You know, they don't always need us to sit and watch cartoons with them, although that's OK sometimes, too. But absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. It, yeah, doing hard things is counterintuitive. And uh-huh. it's that's a hard lesson to teach your kids unless you're doing it yourself. Absolutely. And the trade off is I see parents do this all the time. And I made Sean ride his bike with me when I was doing my training runs. And he just, that was the only option. But then at the end, he got to pick what activities we got to do together. And that, that made it fun for him. It was like, oh, cool. I'll do this thing with my mom. But then it's my turn to pick something. And then when it comes to like flopping the responsibilities, I knew that the spouse wanted to motorcycle ride the whole afternoon or the next day. And so it became this, yep, I want to do this. You want to do this. Lots of communication. And then some weekends it was, we're all going to go do the one thing together as a family. So I do, I feel like, yeah, it can feel selfish, but I come home a better mom. I come home a better wife. I am more dedicated to my work because I know that what I'm asking my clients to do for themselves, I would not have, I would have already done for myself. And so I get it. And I want, I always want my clients to know that I understand that I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't have done myself. So that, that there's some connectivity and rela- relatable um, information to share there and encouragement to let them know that you're going to be better for this for your family mm-hmm. because you're doing something that you can't stop thinking about. And that's not OK. We need to be able to chase those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're going to be joining me this September in Asheville for the running retreat. I am so glad to get you on board. And I would love for you to tell everybody a little bit about what you will be doing and teaching and what you're going to share with the group. Yeah. So I'm going to be taking us through some strength workouts so that we can have an idea of whether you have no gym equipment or limited gym equipment or bands We'll be starting out with some um, basic strength moves so that you know how to safely perform each move and be able to take you through some of those workouts with either kettlebells or dumbbells. We will be in my studio here in Asheville. It is a 1,500 square foot personal training studio. So we'll have access to that and be able to spread out and uh, feel at home. And it's a private training studio, so it's not open to the public. You'll be able to um, just come in and we'll be able to take over and feel at home there. Yeah, and maybe some bar Pilates kind of things you're going to arrange for us. So some stretching and all of that. Yes, we will have a class that will have a combination of yoga, tai chi, and Pilates when it will be performed to um, beautiful music. So there'll be a little music in the background. But I love this combination, this, this trio of movements. One works more breath work and connectivity with your brain and your body. And then, which is important for all of us athletes. And then the other will work a combination of yoga and Pilates. And I don't know about a lot of athletes out there, but I personally struggle with paying attention through these types of practices. And this class is one of my favorites because I tend to just engulf myself in the moves and the music. And it's very fluid and easy to follow. Ooh, I can't wait. I'm definitely going to be doing it with everybody. I'm so excited for that. Uh Um, You're also going to be leading a trail run in our beautiful forest just down the road. So, yeah. So let's get into a little uh, trail running uh, talk. What do you love about the trails? (laughs) I just love knowing that you just ran somewhere that your own two feet had to take you. And that there are so many amazing places to run around the world. But here in Asheville, we have a very large gift of just jumping on the trails within 10 or 15 minutes. And knowing that you could run somewhere within 30 minutes that a car can't take you. You can't drive that to that place. You can't 
um, you can't catch that view in any other way, knowing just other than your two own two feet taking you there to check out the view. And there's something satisfying about that. And then to be able to share it with either your 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 person or your community or your friends and knowing that you all made that trek there. There's something special about being able to share that with other people. Absolutely. I think sometimes uh, road runners who haven't been on the trail or first time beginner runners, they're a little intimidated about trail running. You know, they're scared of the bears or the snakes or twisting their ankle or getting lost. You know, those are the common fears. How would you kind of address that for beginners? Okay. So the one thing no one told me so switching from road running to trail running is you are going to slow down. And that made me mad. No one warned me that. <laughs> and I kept getting mad at myself for being so slow on the trails. And it just took a little bit of practice because you are having to pick your feet up a little bit more, get a little more elbow knee drive, especially uphill. And most definitely watching out for those um, sneaky little uh, branches under uh, under your feet and rocks. So just knowing that you might have to slow it down a little, pay a little extra attention. I personally, our bears here, they're actually pretty friendly. I know people talk about them all the time, but they're more afraid of you than they than you are of them. And you just act big and big and loud and proud is what I tell people. And they they most of the time will leave you alone. The, the, and they're just a unique, fascinating, amazing creature to see. It's such a gift. Um, as far as snakes go, eesh. <laughs> that's, not, that's a that's a nope rope for me for sure um, but i mean they are there they're generally not there to be ag aggressive or vicious but they are there i mean it is the reality of running in our mountains but uh for the most part it, i would say i'd probably run by hundreds of snakes and have never paid attention mm -hmm. and the one time i do pay attention i never see a snake so you're probably not even going to know they were there right <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, very small yes. risk. Yeah, and yes. it, but also about like you know you talked earlier about you're moving in all directions. You got the downhills, you got the rocks, you got the roots, and all of that. So it's a really different. It's a different sport completely than road running. You're using your bodies, especially your ankles. You're you're moving in all different directions. Um, anything that we should prepare for before our first trail run. I think the big thing would be know that you're going to have to slow down a little and that's okay. You're out there to have fun and see something new. And if you happen to have a pair of trail shoes, that would be beneficial with just a little bit of extra grip because run shoes tend to really have more of a little slicker grip, you know, uh, bottom on the shoe. So just being kind of mindful of something that might have a little bit more of a tread on it um, as far as that the trails go. And then just you're going to be you're going to be a little more agile from one foot to the other and you will have to hop around a little bit differently and that's okay just know that you could be sore you could be a little bit more tender and sore in some places differently and um you have to look at the ground a little bit more you kind of can't zone out necessarily if you do want to stop and take in a view or you see something i suggest stopping try not to run and try to view whatever you're looking at that's usually where uh, you face plant pretty well. So, um, yeah, if you want to look, take a, check out something, do slow down or stop. <laughs> yeah, that's honestly the reason I prefer the roads <laughs> because I I am so in my head just thinking about do 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 do, and every time I do that on the trails, bloop on my face. Yeah. Even even on the sidewalk, even on the sidewalk, that happens oh, yeah. to me. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you a trip more walking. <laughs> yes, yes. So you really have to have your mind in the trail. But that's why a lot of people really like it is because you're forced mm -hmm. to be present. You know, yeah. you can't daydream. And, you know, some people listen to music, but for the most part, you're not listening to music. Your watch doesn't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. It's just you and the trail. Yeah. 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 You and the great outdoors. I do encourage people not to listen to music in the woods. I mean, obviously in a group setting, you'll want to be kind of hanging out and chit chatting a little bit still, but the only reason I encourage people not to in the woods is so that you can be bear aware. Um, we tend to look in front of us or like ground level, but we forget to look up in the trees and <laughs> they tend to like to hang out there too. So it's just always good to just have your, ha 
have a hear of what's going on, plus just being uh, eyes, eyes being more present and checking things out just above eye level. Yeah. Yeah. Great <laughs> advice. Well, hopefully we haven't scared anybody away. I mean, the bears really, they're not that big of a deal no, here. I actually, they really aren't. Yeah. It actually, I've lived here for over 20 years and really have only seen bears a handful of times. It's not like you go on a run and they're there all the time, mm-hmm. but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, well, I am super excited uh, to have you um, Yeah, joining me, helping coach, and to help share your wisdom about balance and being unbalanced <laughs> with with everybody and to get a new perspective because, you know, I'm, I'm the roadrunner and you're the strength coach and the adventurer. Uh, what, what adventures do you have planned this year? So this uh, couple of weeks, I finally am doing uh, another trail race. I haven't done a race in a couple of years. So I myself will do a, a 50K in a few weeks and then some backpacking and some fast packing. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Getting out in our mountains. Perfect. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap this up. Uh, again, I'm so excited to have you both on the Planted Runner podcast today and to join me for the retreat this fall. Thank you so much, Tara. Yes. Thank you. If this conversation got you excited to join us in September for the amazing Asheville running retreat, head over to theplantedrunner.com slash retreat to learn more and sign up for your spot today. I can't wait to meet you this fall. And now it's time for the Mental Strength Minute. Fortify your mind in 60 seconds or less. Today's topic is, it could be worse. Sometimes in running, you get into such a negative headspace that you can't help but focus on how awful you feel in the moment. Your legs hurt, you're out of breath, and you still have so far to go. When this happens, harness that negative energy by thinking of a situation that is far worse than what you have now. Perhaps you think about a time when you were injured and couldn't run, or how you could be standing in line for hours at the DMV, or maybe you imagine a dreadful hours-long Zoom call with your boss. (laughs) Whatever it is, think of something that's far worse than this horrible run. Extra points if you get silly enough to make you smile. We typically think of negative thoughts as a bad thing, but sometimes you can harness them for the positive. Thank you for listening to The Planted Runner or watching it on YouTube. Don't forget that you can win a copy of my book for leaving an Apple Podcast review. So be sure to write yours today right after your run. Reviews are the number one way to boost this show's reach, and it's a great way to tell me what you'd like to hear next because I read every single one. Have a great run today.